live stream with myself now. Yanyi, we are on live. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for uh, attending today. Welcome to Nature Hero Talks 3.0, um, where we talk about environmental literacy. This Nature Hero Talk series is brought to you by uh, Malaysian Nature Society, uh, Negeri Sembilan and Laka Branch. If you'd like to be a voice for nature, be sure to join us um, by going to this link below. You can join as a family, as an individual, or as a school. After you join us, you will be able to uh, network with 14 branches. Oh um, through this link. The objective of this Nature Hero Talk series is to provide basic understanding of the environment around us, the stars, the earth, the plants, and animals, and how we can take care of our planet together. And it's also to encourage more students to take science streams and to conserve nature together in the future. This Nature Hero Talk series is hosted through the ecopartners.online app. And through this app, you can um, go through the events um, and uh, attend, uh, click to attend them and also uh, record your positive environmental impact with equal points. So today's talk will last for 30 minutes um, after this introduction. And after the 30 minutes, the Q&A will pop up on the app where you can click to enter it. Um, you will have 10 minutes to, uh, sorry, the, the quiz will pop up um, and then you can answer the quiz. And at the same time, there will be the Q&A session where you can ask uh, questions to our speaker today and if you're watching from the Facebook live you can also um, type in your questions in the comment section and we will answer them for you during the Q&A. If you'd like to be a volunteer for this uh, talk series please contact us and uh, you will be trained to um, before you will be able to volunteer for this series. So we will have two types of certificates that you can get for this series. The first one is uh, for a, a normal one that is issued by MNS, Negeri Sembilan and Malacca branch, which uh, if you get 70% and above you, on the quiz, you will get the certificate. And uh, on top of that, uh, if you are the fastest and the one with the highest mark within 10 minutes to get um, the, to, 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 to do the quiz, the top five, Will receive prizes and if you complete the follow-up actions um, you will receive 50 equal points the next type of certificate is recognized by the ministry of education in malaysia and to get the certificate you need to attend the two hour long forum which will be held in the end um, of this talk series on the 30th of october and 80 percent of these this quiz uh, of 50 questions will be from the talks that we already covered and 20% will, will be on that day itself. And the top five will get the Sijil Pertandingan or Pachapayan, uh, which is the competition or achievement certificate. And the rest of you who attend on this day will also get a Sijil Pernyataan, which is participation certificate. All the talks uh, so far and in the future in this series will be recorded and you can watch them um, on YouTube. You can now uh, register for this event through the app. Just look for the SDG What Can We Do uh, event and click to attend. And here is the very beautiful poster created by one of our committee members for this event. So now all the certificates will be on uh, obtained from the app itself. So if you go to an event and go for a certificate, you will see a, and if you click this button, you'll be able to download your certificate for your um, extracurricular activities. And 
for the certificate with um, MOE support, you can also go to the um, link. You won't be able to get it now because um, it's not live yet. <laughs> you haven't done the quiz yet. Um, but if you're eligible for a certificate, you, you'll be able to see also two links on that event itself. All right. We would like to thank our sponsors for today, Third Row Conservation Society, Dominique O'Sullivan, and Salute for providing our prizes for the quiz. So thank you very much. So right, um, if you have your phone out with you, uh, there's two QR codes on the screen. The one on the left will bring you to the Facebook page of MNS Negeri Sembilan and Melaka. And the one on the right will bring you to the YouTube channel, which where you can see all our recorded talks. Um, Lunisha will post the link on the chat as well, so you don't have to rush to scan the code. You can just click on the link in the chat. Um, so this is the schedule. Uh, we are on the eighth session now, so well done for following us so far. Today we will talk about life on Earth, the third uh, session with Professor Sean Lum, um, and we'll talk about mangroves. But before that, do you know anyone's birthday is coming? So instead of giving them a gift, why, do we, why don't you um, plant a mangrove tree for them? So there's this promotion going on that you can uh, give a gift of life to plant a mangrove for them and send an e-card as well. So you can find this in the app. If you go down to the promotions tab, you, you will notice that the app has updated a little bit and looks a little bit different. So you go to the promotions tab, you will see this uh, card and then you click on it, we plant for you. Um, and then there is a button sponsor. So you click on the sponsor button and then you can, it will, it will lead you to this page on the third uh, screenshot here where you can type um, how many plants you would like to plant. So if you like to plant, if you are an adult, it's 40 ringgit. If you're a student, it's 25 ringgit per sapling. And then you can type in this gray box how many plants, how many saplings you would like. And then it will show the amount here and the grand total here. And then if you scroll down some more, you will see the payment information to MNS uh, May Bank. And then uh, you can type in the details and you can name the tree, which is optional. And you can send an e-card to check this box and then what type of e-card you would like and email it to somebody, um, your friend, for example. So this way you can um, plant a tree for, for, as, as a present for someone, which is, uh, I think, very, very meaningful. And it also helps MNS to um, maintain their um, mangrove ecosystem in Kuala Selangor. So you can also find more information about uh, this program by going to the importance or KNSP uh, buttons. Okay, so now I will um, introduce to you our speaker of the day. We'll talk about uh, along the river. So Sean, Professor Sean Lam is a lecturer in ecology at Singapore's Nanyang Technology University, NTU, where he has been teaching since 1993. That's the year I was born actually. <laughs> So over the years, he has developed a parallel career as a volunteer with the Nature Society in Singapore, NSS, and he was the president since 2008 until now. So he believes in the importance of civil society as a vital partner in creating a vibrant, inclusive, and kinder communities for people and for nature. So I would like to welcome Sean Lam to give your talk today. Hey, Yin Yu, thank you very much. Uh, um, good to be reminded that uh, <laughs> I've been around for a while. <laughs> thank you very much for the very, very kind in, uh, introduction. Um, I just want to thank all of you for spending this Saturday afternoon, and I hope, uh, I, I hope you'll enjoy the next half hour. I, I was around, I, I've been to a number of these um, Nature Hero talks on sustainable development, and uh, they've been excellent. Two weeks ago, we listened to a talk on primates, and I, as I was listening to it, I, two things: I was really enjoying it a lot. It was it was a wonderful talk, 
And at the same time, I was thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna live up, uh, live up to this standard? You know? So I, I will try my best, uh, 30 minutes. If you have any questions, either today or as a follow-up, uh, please let me know today, of course, in the chat box. And then as a follow-up, you can always um, contact me. Malaysia has many, many expert uh, mangrove researchers, and it really was kind of my colleagues at m and in particular, uh, Mr. V Uncle Vuti, Uncle Vuti for uh, inviting me. So thank, thank you all of you. But um, uh, I, I'm from the, I'm a member of the Nature Society Singapore. Um, we, we were named as such about 30 years ago in 1991, but we started out as the uh, Singapore branch of the Malayan Nature Society. So we're actually, um, we're actually sister organizations and um, it's an honor to come. It's almost like coming home. It's very nice to, to, to be here. And so thank you very much once again. Okay, I keep talking like this. I guess it's gonna be much longer than 30 minutes. So I better start. I'm, um, today's session is called Along the River and um, um, it's really about mangroves and how do the mangroves um, what's the, what are mangroves what's their ecology where can you find them and so on but I, I, I have to remind myself that this whole series is about the sustainable U, UN sustainable development goals and so what I will try my very best to do is to link mangroves not only with nature and nature conservation but how do mangroves play a part in this much broader uh, imperative really to, to get the world back on a sustainable track or to put it on a sustainable track so that all of us will be able to uh, live uh, meaningful, uh, stable, secure, and happy lives. And now the, the pertinent, immediately pertinent uh, goals um, that, you know, to the mangroves, of course, would be goal number 14. Uh, SDG 14, life below water, and um, SDG 15, life on land, because uh, mangroves are both on land and in water. So we'll, let's find out a little bit more about mangroves in the next 30 minutes. So what are they? What do they do for us? Um, are they in any way threatened? And if so, by what? And if they are threatened, then what can we do to ensure that mangroves continue to be a big part of our landscape and an important part of our lives as they currently are. Lastly, I, I want to say, of course, that um, the Malaysian Nature Society, MNS, uh, have, have played and continue to play a major role in the conservation of mangroves, not just in Malaysia, but throughout the tropics. If you look uh, at a map, and I, even, I haven't even said what mangroves are, so if, I'll just go back to that photo of um, Kuala Selangor. Here's the coast, here's the Sungai Selangor, Selangor River. Mangroves essentially are a forest, but they are a forest that are subject to the tide, so meaning that they sit somewhere between the lowest low tide and the highest high tide. Uh, so they're both on land and in water. So that's how SDGs 14 and 15 are relevant to mangroves. And they play a role in both ecosystems, uh, terrestrial as well as uh, aquatic and marine. Now, if you look at the distribution of mangroves and people, you know, uh, I think, was it Lanisha, you were saying you just came from the mangrove earlier today, yeah? So mangroves, of course, are found um, near where you are today. And we normally think of them as tropical ecosystems. And if you look, I've, into this map, I've added the, added the dashed lines, Tropic of Cancer to the north at 23 degrees and Tropic of Capricorn in the south. And the color coding refers to the diversity of mangrove species and red being the highest diversity and, and dark blue the lowest. And as you can see, the highest diversity is found in our region um, where there are up to 30, 40 species of true mangroves, meaning that they're partly inundated at, part in, in, uh, for at least part of the day. And if you look, you see that the, as the further you get from the equator, the diversity of mangroves start to drop off. But unlike uh, what most people believe, mangroves are not restricted to the tropics. 
they extend quite a ways into the temperate zone. So for example, in Asia, they will get into southern Japan, the Ryu Okinawa and other Ryukyu Islands. And in the south, it's unbelievable. They go all the way uh, to Victoria in Australia and to the North Island of New Zealand. That's the furthest south they will go. There are two related but distinct kinds of mangroves. There's what some people will call the um, eastern mangroves. I think it would be better to say the Indo-West Pacific mangroves, which extend from the east coast of Africa right up around the Middle East, Indian subcontinent, all the way across Southeast Asia and Indonesia, down into Australia and the Western Pacific Islands. Where I grew up in Honolulu, uh, Hawaii, even though mangroves can live there, they are a, a non-native exotic species. They just somehow could not disperse naturally um, to Hawaii. There are, there's what's called the Western mangrove, which is um, essentially the Atlantic and Caribbean and uh, along in Mexico. This is, they're related, uh, but a distinct set of species characterizes the Western from Eastern mangroves. And as you can see, the mangroves of Asia are the richest, in, tropical Asia are the richest in the world in terms of the numbers of species. It's incredible. Um, if we look at the total mangrove cover in Malaysia, there's a lot. It's uh, about half a million hectares, which is to say almost 6,000 square kilometers. Now, just for reference, uh, the area of Negeri Sembilan State is a little bit more than the amount of mangrove cover in Malaysia, and it's several times the area of the state of Malacca. And let's not even talk about Singapore at 700 square kilometers. It's uh, my math is pretty bad, but about nine times, eight, nine times the uh, area of Singapore. The most of the mangroves in Malaysia are found in East Malaysia, actually, about 60% in Sabah, another 25% or so in Sarawak, and the remainder, remaining 20% or so in West Malaysia along the peninsula. The East Coast tends to have more, man has more mangroves than the West Coast, and we can talk about that um, uh, in, in a second. So where actually do you find mangroves? So here's a map showing Selangor to the north, going all, you know, this is the kind of extent of Negeri Sembilan along the coast. Where you look for mangroves is where rivers empty out into the sea, especially if the sea is relatively calm, like the Straits of Malacca, or a large river that's relatively sheltered. So a relatively sheltered coast or a river, that's where you would find it. Here's the uh, Kampung Kuala Lukut mangroves in Negeri Sembilan. But every state in Malaysia uh, and in Singapore, we will find mangroves wherever there is a tidal influence and the sea is relatively calm. Here at the border of uh, Selangor and Negeri Sembilan is the Sepang, Sungai Sepang. And again, you can see from this aerial photo already, here's the mangrove, and it should stretch all the way back as far as the tides will reach. So even where there's a little bit of salt water from the highest high tide reaching into the river, it may almost taste fresh. Uh, plants can pick it up, and you will find mangrove forests there. Some of the earliest and classic work on mangrove research was actually done in the peninsula uh, out, of the, uh, uh, out of the Forest Res Research Institute. And um, this 1928 classic by Watson is still, in a way, the go-to book for understanding the biology of mangroves. Uh, so let's look at a little bit of the fauna and flora. There's really just so much, and I will try to guide you to some online resources afterwards. I, I can only cover a little. Um, Mangrove plants, there's so many. There are about 30, uh, 35 mangrove species total in Malaysia, and you can see there's a whole array of them. Some of them may be quite familiar to you, and they've got, you know, interesting, interesting features. Now, if you think about any place where there's a tide coming in and out, you can, you can type in the chat box if you'd like to. What would you think some of the challenges to being a mangrove plant would be compared to, say, a plant growing in uh, regular forest. What do you experience as a mangrove tree that a, or even an animal, that a tr plant on land would not experience? So some of you might think, oh yeah, maybe there's the salinity, right, because the tides come in. So it's saline and salt is generally not so good 
um, for mangrove plants. And again, that already leads to some interesting, yes, the ground is very soft. Yes, yes yin yi, that's absolutely right. And so that means um, plants need to be able to get into that soil very quickly, grow their roots so that they don't get washed away when the tides come. That's one. Uh, the salinity would be another. The mud also tends to be very low in oxygen. So that's a problem because even uh, so roots need oxygen because it's living tissue. And with regard to the tides, you know, if you, t uh, well, we can talk about that one. Oh, strong waves. Again, Yukmoy, thank you. Uh, that's a problem. So salinity, tides, anoxia, being exposed and covered up. These are physiologically very stressful conditions. And so mangroves need to adapt to them. And maybe it's for this reason that we, we would find perhaps um, maybe 40 species in a diverse mangrove, where easily in Negrisimbilan at the uh, Paso Forest Reserve, you have 900 species of trees in the terrestrial forest. So uh, relatively rich, but ultimately much lower than terrestrial diversity, presumably because of the just the difficult life of in this saline, always moving, uh, soft, uh, anaerobic uh, conditions in the soil. But these mangrove plants are remarkable. They can overcome it. Just for example, for the salt, I'll give you two examples. These trees here, the bakao or rhizophora, they actually filter out the salt water so only fresh water gets taken in. That takes a lot of energy. On the other hand, this group of plants called api api or avicennia, uh, they are salt secretors. So they actually take in the salt and then excrete them very quickly through their glands. So if you actually took your finger to the um, this uh, uh, Avicennia leaf, touch the top of the leaf and uh, put it on your tongue. You'll see, notice it tastes salty. I used to actually lick these uh, Avicennia leaves until uh, one day, I think I was tr demonstrating that to some students and I accidentally licked uh, a whole bunch of insects. So that wasn't so not advisable. Uh, and beautiful things. You see, here's this uh, Pisang Pisang or Aegiceras, a back mangrove species. Can you see how, um, the, the fruit has already started to germinate while it's on the plant. This is known as vivipary or, or live birth, literally. And um, many plants already, and again, let's, let's um, go to that diagram. Many mangrove fruits are ready to germinate immediately. There's, there's no time to waste. The, the plant needs to send its roots immediately into the mud the moment it gets stuck in some, a crevice or between roots. So that's, a, that's an another amazing adaptation of mangrove plants. And as far as the, here's the Baka uh, Kurap, the uh, Rhizophora mucronata, I think it is. Um, here's the, the, this fruit was here, but the seed begins to germinate and this is already the root of the baby plant. For this species, the root may be as long as one meter. So you can imagine, this is a related plant called Brugiera, and can you see how it's also started to germinate before it's even dispersed from the tree? Uh, this is beautiful, this uh, 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 Tumumera or Brugiera gymnoriza. Um, this, this is really cool for those of you who are ornithologists especially. Um, how does the, this get pollinated? It's red in color, so it's actually pollinated by birds, and when birds go to drink nectar, the, the, uh, the pollen pollen-bearing structures called the stamens are actually zipped up between what are called the petals of the flower. So when, a, and they have little hairs on them. When a bird touches the hairs on the petals, it suddenly zips open really quickly and the stamen with the pollen comes flinging out and puts a whole bunch of pollen dust on the bird. So that's the, you know, you, you get a reward, the nectar, but you, you, it comes, you have to do a service, which is pollinate. So that's the Brugiera. And here's, here's some roots. Remember we were saying this, this, these roots are low in oxygen. So in this bakao, the stilt-rooted bakao or rhizophora, there are these structures that allow the, like cork almost, that allow air to go in and out of the tissue of the root. And likewise, there's corky tissue in the breathing roots or pneumatophores, pencil roots of a plant called Avicennia or Api Api. Um, likewise, with this Brugiera root, um, it will eventually start to do a kind of a, um, 
it, it will form what are called knees where the roots go up and down and the top part of the knee is also spongy where air can come in and out so there there are many adaptations to the low oxygen the tides and the salinity of the mangrove so it's absolutely remarkable um, and I encourage you please um, read up and, and and go to the mangroves even better still um, there's something interesting that's the atap or nipa uh, which is used by people for thatch and this is found in the mangrove wherever there's a little bit of freshwater seepage I into a stream watson in 1928 already uh, realized that there was a clear distinct zonation in the mangrove so it's almost a predictable predictable set of species certain ones up at the front on the seaward side of the mangrove and as the salinity decreases as you go up the river and the uh, degree of inundation of salt water is less and less um, you have what I call the back mangrove species so from the back to the front changing in uh, topography also salinity and you can see this zonation clearly at any mangrove um, that you go to now here's a bit of trivia. These are four cities or towns in Malaysia, in, uh, in West Malaysia, Ipoh, Dungun, Petaling Jaya, and Malacca. They are all named after trees. So Malacca is named after this gooseberry, uh, uh, a type of uh, uh, phylanthus. Uh, Petaling Jaya is, is the, a rainforest. Uh, Petaling is a rainforest species. Ipo is a rainforest species also most famous for the poisonous sap that natives uh, uh, indigenous tribes use for the blow blow gun uh, ipo and dungun in the state of tranganu is a coastal town and dungun is actually the name of a mangrove or back mangrove species called heritiera or in 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 uh, local uh, uh, parlance it's dungun so there is a major town in West Malaysia named actually after a mangrove tree, the town of Dungun near Kuala Trenganu. Now, how about some mangrove fauna? Let's just quickly go through this. And I'm a botanist, so I, you know, I'm biased, but I, I love animals too. Um, the estuarine crocodile is perhaps one of the better known uh, mangrove associated species, although this is such an adaptable creature, it can be found in many different types of habitats. Um, this thing called the mangrove, uh, sorry, mud lobster is actually very hard to see uh, because it stays underground all the time feeding on the detritus and it makes these little caverns and, and, and passageways in the, uh, uh, under the surface of the mud. And it pushes the spent or used up mud to the surface and makes these big volcanic structures which could be almost two meters tall. The mud lobster is an example of what some ecologists call an ecosystem engineer, meaning that the animal actually transforms the physical environment. And these mounds become homes for certain kinds of plants. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, uh, certain kinds of, for example, this fern, uh, PI fern, is only found on mud lobster mounds in many mangrove systems. Crabs, fish uh, make their homes in mud lobster mounds. So it's a keystone, what's called a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer. Here are some mangrove birds, um, copper-throated sunbird, a mangrove whistler, uh, mangrove pitta, uh, for example. And interestingly, I guess <laughs> the local names are, are, are very telling, right? Because it's it's the, they put bakau or mangrove on the end of it. So the kalicha bakau is the mangrove uh, sunbird and the mangrove uh, pitta has the bakau on it. So there are, these are things that you can typically find or, or mangrove specific uh, species. Now, some of these mangroves, uh, this is the copper-throated sunbird, which is most commonly seen in the mangroves. But these are the ones you might find in, 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 in the town or gardens, like the crimson sunbird or the olive back sunbird, Malacca, the uh, Seremban, KL, PJ, JB. All of these towns, you will find these sunbirds. But this one, you need to mostly go to the mangrove, the copper-throated sunburn, sunbird. Did I say sunburn? Sunbird. Um, also known as the Kalicha bakau. Um, some very characteristic species of fish include the mudskipper. The largest is the giant mudskipper, which is 27 
centimeters. These are big fish. And, and there's a much smaller mudskipper, the dusky gilled, only six centimeters, so a quarter the size of the giant. And here's a medium-sized one, the blue spotted. Look for the mudskippers uh, when you go to the mangrove. I would like to play you a very short video about a fish that you can commonly encounter in the brackish water, the mix of salt and fresh. This is the archer fish. So let's see what this one has to say. Sorry, you can't hear the sound, yeah? I'm trying to take off my... Oh, okay, sorry about that. To study this technique, two researchers from the University of Bayreuth in Germany first spent about a year training archer fish. The fish had to shoot water from just the right spot in the aquarium so high-speed cameras could catch the action. What the scientists found was that whether the target was at about eight inches, 16 inches or even 24 inches the drop that slammed the target that bullet at the end of the jet came together for maximum impact at just the right moment so how does the fish do it it doesn't just spit harder it opens and closes its mouth in a way that varies the speed of different parts of the water jet quite a trick and humans use water jets for all kinds of purposes this new understanding of the archerfish technique could lead to improvements in everything from surgical tools to fire hoses. Uh, archerfish, very, very common species of mangrove. I, I love uh, mangrove fish. Um, um, so look out for it next time. There are a few uh, mammals, very prominent ones. The long-tailed macaque, of course, is, is very commonly associated with mangrove habitats. And if you go to Sabah, uh, rivers such as the Kinabatangan, or um, even in Brunei, uh, in Bandar Seri Begawan, you may find the proboscis monkey, because it often is also found along mangrove uh, watercourses. Many mollusks, too many to mention, too many, such as a telescope, the shell, the mangrove oyster, and, and so many others. So you can imagine how the mangroves are, were traditionally and still are for many people a rich source of food. So they provide, um, I guess, what we, we call an ecosystem service, isn't it, where we, we depend directly on mangroves for food. Um, also, in terms of ecosystem, remember we were saying that mangroves cover both life on land and life um, underwater, life below water. Um, mangroves are in this middle of a very important transition. So you go from dry land forest to a swamp, often a peat swamp or freshwater swamp. And then you hit the mangrove as you get increasingly um, into the estuary and to the river mouth and to the open sea. And then from the open sea, you'll have mangroves, often seagrass communities and coral. So mangroves are in this very critical transition. Um, from the forest to the open sea. And it shows that there's actually, it's not life on land or life below water, but th they all interact forming this continuum. So you can't just uh, preserve one habitat without conserving the one up or downstream of it. It, it, it you know, there, there is this whole holistic um, connection and synergy between ecosystems, which we're learning more and more about. So what do we get from mangroves? Well, we get lots of services. Some of them might be directly uh, products. So for example, the mangrove poles of Bacau, uh, Rhizophora, are used often in uh, building or making scaffolds. Maybe some of you have seen uh, around your town uh, this traditional scaffolding using Bacau poles, which are sturdy and relatively lightweight and about the right size, and then Sometimes traditionally they would use a rattan, rotan strips to tie them. Even tall buildings used to use this kind of bakau uh, scaffolding. Here's some Singapore flats that were built, being built in the 1970s using this bakau timber. 
course, if you go further north, such as uh, South China, you know, Hong Kong, they might substitute the bakao, which is not that common up there with the bamboo. And of course, bakao also is the preferred choice for making charcoal. Um, you can you could imagine the demand here uh, from this company in Singapore. You can see all the charcoal products, but your eyes will pop one box of this high grade bakao charcoal, which they use the Japanese term binchotan for 10 kgs, 50 Singapore dollars, which I think is about 160 Malaysian ringgit. So, man, that's, that's pretty high value. I hope, though, in the name of sustainable development, that the actual harvester is getting a fair uh, compensation for the hard work involved in the harvesting of these uh, bakao poles. Um, food, um, mud crab, signature dish of much of Southeast Asia. And I don't want to cause a diplomatic row between Singapore and Malaysia as to who invented dishes like the chili crab, but let's say it's part of our shared heritage. Um, there are, I think, seven species of mud crab. We used to all think of them as one, and they extend all the way across the Indo-Pacific. You see, I mean, the, the tremendous demand um, and the identity in a way. We're, our, our national identities are bound up in the mangroves because mud crabs are, are from the mangroves. My, my father-in-law uh, lived in, in Singapore in a town that was right in the mangrove estuary and he used to go crabbing and fishing and collecting firewood. Um, just one generation before me, imagine uh, even in a modern city like KL or, or Seremban or Malacca, Singapore, people uh, just a generation ago still much of their lives revolved around natural habitats like mangroves. Uh, but mangroves are in short supply, m m mud crabs, sorry, uh, because of the great demand. I mean, just, just Singapore alone, and we're not the biggest uh, consumer of mud crab. Much of that goes to China, Hong Kong, Japan, and so on. 10 tons of mud crab every day, or 3 million kilograms per year. I imagine the stress that puts on to natural systems to provide that, that amount, and that's just one city, Singapore. KL, I'm sure, is uh, uh, consuming uh, equi equi equivalent amount. Lots of uh, mangrove fish, too. Two in particular, you may know, the um, uh, siakap, or sea bass, and this uh, mangrove jack. But here's another, not just, not just fish from aquaculture like the sea bass, but this is sport fishing, which is a relatively high value uh, type of recreation. So this would also be called, I suppose, a ecosystem service where recreation is considered one of the provisioning uh, type services of ecosystems. Other services include carbon storage and mangroves per area, unit area, store more carbon even than forest, rainforests on, on land. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'll just quickly answer this question, uh, Vuti. Mud crab uh, for food, farmed or wild, much of it is still wild caught. Um, there are attempts to try to farm it, but I think it's not so, not so easy, not so easy. Um, and, and there's a company, a few companies in Singapore and Malaysia trying to do it now. Now, mangroves, unfortunately, because of their location, and they act as a nursery for, for lots of uh, animals. So I haven't even said mentioned prawns. Many of the prawns that we eat, tiger prawns, for example, they live much of their lives in the mangrove. So the traditional prawn culture involves digging up a pond out of the mangrove, and the, the, est the water from the river, the salty water from the estuary goes into the pond carrying with it uh, larval prawns and you just seal off the pond so the tide doesn't come in and out anymore you let the baby prawns grow to maturity and then at a low tide drain the pond and then out come the prawns of course now it's a higher tech type of aquaculture but it's still largely dependent on the mangrove and because of the widespread conversion of mangrove to prawn aquaculture, it's causing a huge loss in mangrove cover in many, many different areas. Um, we are earlier talked about unsustainable extraction of whether it's mud crabs or bakao poles for charcoal. Um, it's, it's really uh, difficult. And coastal development, you know, people like to live on coasts, not just mangroves. And so there's often a kind of a conflict uh, potential uh, there. 
uh, rising sea levels, also a big worry because they will flood mangroves. And the mangroves, of course, can keep up with the tide and just retreat inland uh, as the waters rise. But if they run into development, then that would be kind of the end of the mangrove. It just can't retreat anymore because there's no new land to colonize. People are already there. If you look at this uh, figure from a colleague of mine in NUS, uh, Professor Dan Fries, you can see in some areas that are lost to aquaculture, some places like uh, some estuaries in Indonesia lost almost half their mangroves. Parts of the Andaman Sea in North Sumatra, 60% mangrove loss. Um, Vietnam, look, half of the mangrove in nine estuaries that were studied, and even in the Americas, whether that's Brazil, Ecuador, um, Peru, sizable amounts of mangroves lost just in the period of when I was born, or I shouldn't say that, even when Yun Yi was born till today, the mangrove loss continues. And that's a worry. Um, annual deforestation rates of mangroves continue, especially high in places like Myanmar. I think the Malaysian figure is mainly from East Malaysia, places like Sabah. But uh, you know, no country is in the range of mangroves is exempted from this. Brazil has a low average annual deforestation rate, presumably also because <laughs> it has a lot of mangrove. Um, so relative, as a relative percentage, it's pretty low. But you see again, here, here, here's a map showing where mangrove loss is particularly acute in Southeast Asia. Again, from Professor Fries's paper, Sulawesi for one, parts of Java, the Andaman, Andaman uh, Nicobar Islands the, in the Andaman Sea, uh, parts of Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, uh, Eastern Indonesia. It, it's, it's just um, the demand for mangrove area and mangrove products, wood and aquaculture is uh, staggering. Even you can see the Kampung Lukut mangroves, which are some of the bigger ones, in, in Negri Sembilan. Can you see all of this, this area, this developed area, na naturally would have been under mangrove cover, but it's been converted to ponds or um, um, sometimes human settlement. But I'm happy to say that the Malaysian Nature Society is among a number of prominent groups working very hard to protect mangroves and much more. Um, do you know about some of the nature education centers of the MNS? Here are a few. If you live near uh, KL, in, in, in the town of Kepong is the FRIM, uh, which is the Forest Research Institute, uh, FRIM MNS Nature Education Center. That's in a rainforest area. Uh, let's see. If you go up to the Cameron Highlands near the town of Tanarata in Perak, uh, there's the Bo MNS Nature Study Center. So that would be a ma uh, montane type uh, habitat. Um, here, though, on the east coast in Tranganu is the Eco Care Center, and th there is some mangrove restoration work being done here as well. And of course, um, the one of the crown jewels in Malaysian conservation, in my opinion, is the Kuala Selangor Nature Park, entirely run and managed by uh, the Malaysian Nature Society. And there's Kuala Selangor again. See, here's the part. But can you see the pressure on the mangroves? Because the town of Kuala Selangor has, uh, has occupied, has been, this is built on reclaimed mangrove land. Because it, here's the Selangor River in the mouth. It's a big river. All of this, this is in the floodplain of the Selangor River, would naturally have been um, mangrove forest. Um, one of the prominent programs is the We Plant For You at Kuala Selangor Nature Park. Um, a, and I think uh, Yin Yi was mentioning it earlier. And so I, I should just say Yin Yi and um, Uncle Vuti, the Nature Society, my friends and I, NS Nature Society Singapore, would like to adopt, uh, we're, we're targeting 100 uh, mangrove saplings to, to plant at Kuala Selangor. So let's see, um, uh, please, uh, look out for good news. And there are many people who love Malaysian mangroves, so it's all not, not doom and gloom, but this is a big part of our shared heritage. It's a big part of the, it was a big part of the life of our ancestors and knowingly or unknowingly, uh, still a big part of our lives today. 
this brings me back, you know, to the sustainable development goals. Um, when we, it's easy as a conservationist to say, let's just stop clearing mangroves and just let it be. But there are other things that come into the picture. Local communities, um, they need livelihoods, they need education, they need clean and affordable uh, uh, water, um, they need jobs and good infrastructure. And so it's easy for us to try to condemn people who would try to exploit mangroves, sometimes unsustainably, but to make the sustainable development goals stick, the life on land and below water has to be coordinated with other kinds of um, development uh, programs. But the mangroves do so many services for us. They, by sequestering carbon, they regulate our climate. They provide us with food. They provide us with recreational opportunities. They do so much more. It would almost seem uh, like a natural thing for us to really work harder, double, triple the effort, uh, given that mangroves do so much for us to save them and expand them and to turn the tide no pun intended, to turn the tide so that mangroves will have a brighter future um, in the years ahead. Um, one example of sustainable development, and I'm almost at the end, uh, Yin Yi, um, the Matan mangroves in Perak, so just outside of Taiping. This has been continuously managed for the past 100 years and is the, possibly the, the world's best example of a sustainably managed mangrove forest. So as you can see from this, uh, aerial photo, um, these are different These are different parts of the mang Matang mangrove, which were har harvested 15 years ago, harvested 20 years ago, harvested 30 years ago. And so they manage this in blocks, and they clear block by block so that it becomes a very sustainable rotation. And believe it or not, they've been doing it for 100 years and still doing it today. So if you ever get a chance to see uh, would like to see a, a model for good mangrove management, the world's best model. It's in Malaysia, in, in, in the Matang, near Taiping. So, you know, we talked about the value of mangroves, didn't we? Um, why, they're, why they're good for us. But um, we could call it ecosystem services provisioning services, recreational activity. But there are certain things in nature that you can only say that they're miraculous or magical. Um, and I, I can think of three or four, but here, here are two of them. This would be the annual spawning of coral. Every year, uh, on a few days after the full moon, on the fourth month of the year, these corals in our tropical waters in Asia start to release egg and sperm in this incredible, magical, reproductive event. And let's, let's forward this a little bit so you can see here, here, here come the eggs of the um, coral. Every so many years, our forests flower. And when they flower, here are some Maranti fruits. Look at them falling to the ground. I would call this another miracle of living in Malaysia or Singapore, to be able to have the privilege. Of, so the end of this video kind of spoils it. There's some houses, you know, you think you're in a forest. Huh? But look at that, just millions of eggs of coral, millions of fruits of Maranti and other dipterocarps uh, flowering and dropping. Um, and uh, here, in Nigris and Bilan, the raptor migration. That's another miracle of nature in Malaysia, near where you are, near where you're sitting right now. Amazing things. But there's another uh, miracle of nature. And you can see this in March, by the way. This would be the, um, this would be the synchronous fireflies. They are found in different parts of the world, but in uh, Malaysia, it's best it's, you can see them you will be able to discover the answer to this ancient mystery of nature. in mangroves be sure to see the fireflies soon They're you can see them in Kuala Selangor it known how long 
these bright beetles will continue to shine in the night at Campon Quantan. Perhaps the colonies will find another place to inhabit to continue their life cycles somewhere. Now you can call it what you want, recreational, ecosystem service, provisioning service, cultural service. I would rather like to say that nature is magic, wondrous, awe-inspiring. And I think even above and beyond any practical value to humans, this tropical nature that we are blessed with is so incredibly magical that anyone who gets a chance to experience it would only naturally think that it's our duty to protect it. So with that, I want to thank uh, Yin Yi for, and Lanisha for kindly introducing me today, and of course to Uncle Vuti and friends at the MNS and Greece and Bilan, uh, Malacca branch, and friends from all over uh, for being such a fantastic um, uh, group to give me this wonderful opportunity and privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sean. Um, watching those videos just gave me lots of goosebumps and it, it got me, it reminded me of how wonderful our ecosystem is. And um, thank you so much for your talk. And it was really interesting. And uh, actually this morning when I went to Pulau Inda, I saw those, um, I think we, we think it's the mud skipper tracks on the sand. And I just think like mud skippers are so fascinating because they, they live on the edge <laughs> like mangroves because they they are both uh, water and land species <laughs> yeah so uh, before i hand over to lenisha i'll just um, make a couple of announcements okay all right so let's look at the app um so now today we are in this along the river uh, so now here you can already see the quiz button where you can click on it and start answering questions. And also there is this uh, follow-up action that can earn you 50 eco points called My Mangrove. Uh, if you click on it, um, it will ask you to look for the nearest mangrove area near your home. Um, we have already seen some examples from uh, Sean's talk. So try to find examples that were not mentioned um, in Malaysia or in Singapore. Um, how would you find a mangrove? Maybe look at where uh, the forest links with the ocean. And if you zoom in, probably that's a mangrove. So get the long latitude and longitude and paste it into this app. Learn more about um, what the mangrove, uh, organi what organizations are protecting those mangroves. Uh, maybe you can talk about it next week. So thank you very much. And I shall pass on to Lenisha to the Q&A session where you can ask questions, uh, talk about the questions in the chat. All right, thank you very much, Yen Yi. Okay, a uh, very good afternoon to Dr. Sean and uh, everyone participating in this talk today. So um, I am Lenisha and I'll be conducting the Q&A session. And we meet again in another uh, exciting episode of the Nature Hero Talk. And today we have uh, Dr. Sean with us. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sean, for sharing your very knowledgeable insights. It was very exciting listening to your talk. And without further ado, uh, let me begin with the first question. So uh, this is from uh, Mr. Woody. Uh, are archer fishes can be found in tropic mangroves? Um, yes. Um, you know, I, as a kid, I was always fascinated by these fish. And, and they're, they're sold in the aquarium trade. But... Um, Imagine when I first came to Singapore, Malaysia, that I went to the mangrove and actually saw them. I was so excited. And so they, they actually quite commonly seen one of the more prominent members of the mangrove fish uh, fauna in this uh, brackish water, uh, it, along with half beaks and uh, agar fish and, and a few others, the scat. But yeah, the, the, you can find them in, um, especially near the coast, so closer to the coast rather than way upstream. But I'm, I can be corrected, uh, Abbott or, 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 or Lai Peng or anyone. Okay, so uh, the second question would be uh, by Mr. Harris. Due to rising sea level, mangroves would be continuously be inundated. How would this affect mangroves? Yeah, no, that's a great and interesting question. It's uh, if, let's say there was very little... Um, a coastal development and human settlement, 
mangroves should be able to keep up with rising sea level, right? Because the fruits are dispersed by the waters and then the, the, each different species finds its place based on the um, salinity of the water. So even with rising sea level, mangroves should be able to keep up and just, just in, in a way track the tides. But with, um, with, if you couple that with the development along our coasts, the mangroves might actually hit an area where there is no land that can be uh, occupied or if there is a, a bund or sea wall that keeps the, you know, as flood protection, that also would basically the mangroves would come up against the dead end. So they sh normally should be able to uh, cope, but w w if you add human impacts to it and coastal development, many mangroves will be um, in trouble, unfortunately. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sean. We move on to the next question. Uh, this is by Yan Yi. What is something of a hidden gem that you personally encountered encountered in a mangrove forest? Oh my goodness, uh, so many. Um, of, of course, it, 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 you, there's no words to describe seeing for the first time the fireflies, the calip calip. That is just, I mean, if again, I, I can only use the word magic. Um, but even something, you know, actually, Yan Yi, about 30 years ago, uh, um, I saw a mud lobster walking on the mud and I'm not supposed to see mud lobster because they're always un under underneath the mud. And so that I think for me was, was ex ex I mean, it's not that glamorous sounding, but that for me was exciting. I was like, Alamak, it's not supposed to be here, but here it is, you know, so uh, a, a very um, kind of mundane experience was extremely exciting for me. That is so cool. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Dr. Sean. Uh, this is another question. Uh, besides aquaculture farming, what are other threats to mangroves? Oh, okay. Besides aqua, other threats? Yeah, other threats. Yeah. So if there, so that that's a huge one, the conversion to aquaculture. But also, if it's unsustainable harvest, like say for example the mud crab, the de, if the demand is higher than what it can supply, um, that that could be hugely damaging. Also. Uh, unsustainable harvest of timber for charcoal or for uh, the, the, the construction poles and everything in some areas if it's not you know if it's not done like how Matang does it very systematically um, that could really destroy a mangrove and obviously if you saw all the aerial photos um, that I showed you could see towns had are built often on reclaimed mangrove land so coastal areas are good for people so where uh, so coastal ecosystems are always threatened by human impacts because the coast is such a practical and desirable place to put a settlement and to conduct business. Um, so we we need to find we need to find a, a, a viable and balanced way to, uh, to accommodate both development as well as keeping enough of these habitats to provide. Uh, the critical ecosystem services, as well as the magic and wonder of living next to mangroves. Thank you very much, Akshan, for the very uh, insightful explanation. So we move on to the next question. Uh, does the archer fish live their entire life cycle in brackish water? Uh, you know, I'm not entirely, I believe it does. I believe it does. It can be kept in fresh water or acclimatized to fresh water, but I think it's one of those um, brackish water species. You tend not to find it so much swimming around the open ocean uh, or uh, sandy, sh but you will find it swimming around in the mangroves. But, but they can tolerate higher salinity as well as lower, so I think they're fairly adaptable in that physiological sense. All right, so we have another question. Uh, what is special? What is special about mangrove forests or unique about them? Oh, okay. Um, well, be, they're unique because I think they are kind of nature's solution to extremely, imagine if you took a handful of salt and you sprinkled it on your neighbor's houseplants, they would not be very happy to say the least because it's, it's a very stressful, it throws off the water balance of these plants. And yet mangroves, plants and animals, they have to deal with uh, being underwater and then exposed. Imagine the stress from that. Or sometimes part of the day, fresh water, and then the rest of the day, 
salt water. Imagine the stress of that also. And also having roots in mud, which has very little oxygen. Just the fact that they can cope with these con conditions, I think, is, is actually quite staggering. And the unique flora and fauna. And just if you, you know, deep in a mangrove to the smell and the, the warmth and the sounds, um, it's, it's, it's so difficult to describe, but it's such a unique sensation. I love rainforests and I study them, but I, I must also say that the mangrove is uh, uh, such a special place. So you prefer a man mangrove over rainforest, is it? Oh, now you're asking that. <laughs> That's an unfair question, Venetia. <laughs> it's like saying, which parent do you like better, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, I love them both. I love them both. Both of them are unique in their own ways. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And this we're not even talking about coral reef or seagrass or anything like that yet. Okay, we have another question from, from Mr. Harris. Uh, in October 2020, the mangrove area in Pantai Chermin, Tanjong Tuan was affected by oil spill dumping. Is this becoming a common threat to mangroves? Um, yes, it is. And not just, not just uh, Linisha in um, uh, Malaysia but around the world. And if you think of many of the areas where there's in the tropics where there's oil extraction, such as, for example, in Africa, the Niger River Delta, which also has mangroves, you can begin to imagine the scale of uh, the, the, of the threat that's posed by oil spills. The tankers are getting bigger and bigger. There's more and more traffic in, in our waters, uh, increasing the risk of, uh, of accidents, which then could dump the oil, you know, onto the coast. So, it, it is a worry. Um, and again, it's, you know, how do we balance all of our needs? Now, of course, if we want uh, sustainable development, we'll be using less oil in the future. So hopefully oil spill will be less of a threat, hopefully. Um, having said that, uh, what if all mangroves are extinct? What would happen? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. It, uh, I think in terms of the amount of carbon released to the atmosphere, that'd be terrible. Think of all the goods and services that mangroves provide. We'd lose them. Think of um, the coastal protection against storm surges. It's tsunami. So it's, it's one of our best protection against sea level rise. And as storms get more intense and, and more frequent, uh, t having no mangrove in front of the coast where there used to be mangroves could have very, very severe uh, consequences for property and for life. And, uh, you know, one tragic event, of course, was uh, the, uh, the Boxing Day tsunami from, you know, over 20 years ago. Many, many towns um, were inundated by this, the, the tsunamis that were generated by the North, the Aceh earthquake in the north of Sumatra and many towns that had cleared their mangroves actually suffered quite a bit more damage than those that had the mangroves there. So just as a natural protection against storms and uh, these, uh, these uh, natural hazards that are only going to increase in frequency with rising uh, seas and climate change, I think sometimes mangrove is, is nature's free solution uh, uh, to, to some of these uh, environmental hazards. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sean. So uh, we have a few minutes for probably uh, two questions. So the first one is from Belinda. How will climate change and rising sea levels affect mangrove forests and what should we do about it? Yeah, that's, that's interesting, uh, Belinda. So we had earlier mentioned that uh, mangroves you know, the sea levels have never been constant. They've been up and down for, 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 for as long as there's been an ocean and land. And mangroves, for as long as they have been around, have been tracking that sea level rise. But what's unprecedented about this one is the rate of sea level rise and also the fact that um, much of the land that, that mangroves could normally occupy as they track that changing sea level is now unavailable to, to them because there's development or other, other uh, land use um, that is not mangrove friendly, so to speak. And so um, what are we going to do about it? I think, I think w we need to come up with a better balance between exploiting mangroves and preserving them in a very strategic way. I think we also uh, might need to anticipate a sea level rise and be prepared 
for reforestation and other efforts that will uh, conserve what we have, restore what we need. And, um, you know, the, I, I keep saying this, it's, it's like, you know, we take care of our elders and, the, and those who are not able to move about freely, not because they give us economic benefit, but because that's kind of a, a moral, the ethical imperative. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think preserving mangroves ultimately, and nature in general, we, we should do it, not just because it gives us something, but it's really the right thing to do. Very well said, Dr. Sean, I agree with that. And we have uh, another question. This is the last question. Uh, how are mangroves classified? How are mangroves classified? Oh, okay. So there would be, in terms of the actual vegetation itself, um, you you might go by the zonation of the mangrove. So say the 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 more coastal type mangroves versus the um, the mangroves. The so if you think of it, the front, middle, and the back. So the back mangrove would be those species that have a lower salinity preference. The mid middle range zone, I think, are the most adaptive mangroves. They they can. They can tolerate low salinity, but also the higher salinity. And then it, when you get to the front, you'll find something like uh, Api Api Pute, which is the Avicennia alba, which is always found up at the coast. These are the, the, the coastal, uh, the, the, op, you know, the river mouth type. So that would be kind of within a mangrove itself, the zonation. But then it, geographically, you would have the Indo-Pacific mangroves, which we have that stretch from East Africa all the way to Australia and down to New Zealand even. And then there would be the, the, the um, West African um, Atlantic Caribbean mangrove, which is a smaller set of mangrove species that, but they are um, related to, to our uh, mangroves in, in that they belong to the same groups of plants. Um, and then there are other ways to c classify them too, even just a practical way, which ones um, are useful, uh, which ones are less economically, you know, um, um, of economic benefit. I mean, that would be how traditionally people would have used mangroves based on how much benefit they can derive from them. So there are many different ways, but if um, I can recommend afterwards some books on the taxonomy and the biology of mangroves, that, that might be interesting reading. And you can also Google, I think the Singapore Science Center has a whole book of um, mangrove handbooks. It's all online. Uh, so just type mangrove Singapore and then you will get the reference all the mangroves we have are also found in Malaysia. All right, uh, so I think this would be the last question. Just came in last moment, sorry, Dr. Sean. Uh, it's about mangrove res resto restoration. Uh, it's driven by good intentions, but offering limited results. How true is this? Yes, unfortunately, you know, some, so many things have good intentions, don't they? And then, and then they end up actually not being effective or sometimes causing a bit more damage. The trick to um, mangrove restoration, and I'm not the expert, my colleague at the National University, Professor Dan Fries, is. You remember that we talked about the mangrove zonation? Some are up at the front where the highest salinity and lower elevation, and some are on slightly. There's a topography to mangroves, and there's a salinity zone. Um, so just planting willy-nilly, just assuming that anything that's tidal is good for mangroves, often results in failure. So it's really good to understand physically where the water goes, how saline it is, and then based on the physical conditions, match the appropriate mangrove to that. So I think that that seems to be the way. And also, you think if the, the mangroves come in and out on, on their own, uh, so Dan Fries always says, if a mangrove can grow someplace, it probably already is there. So it would really be in the taking, say, let's say we wanted to take a prawn pond and re-restore that back to mangrove. Uh, it would be probably a combination of natural regeneration plus human assisted based on our understanding of the mangrove's needs and the physical characteristics of that site. Um, Actually, Lanisha, may I just take one second to introduce my colleague, Yap Von Bing. He, he's, his yeah, camera sure. is off there, but he's a native, he's a local boy from Seremban uh, and is a professor here in Singapore. But um, his, his heart is uh, uh, clearly and soul is, um, he's, he's come home today. So uh, hello, Prof Yap. Hello, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Oh. Such a pleasure to see all you people who care so much Thank about you. nature. 
All right, I think uh, that's it for the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean, for answering the questions. Uh, I'll pass this session back to Yanni. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and uh, it's such thank a privilege. Thank you, Professor Sean, for answering all the important and interesting questions. And I think we all learned a lot from you today. Yeah, so I hope we will have, uh, we, we can continue to chat about how important uh, mangroves are. Um, and if you are happy with it, you can leave your email address in the chat so that if any students or uh, participants have any questions, they can email you. Um, so now I'm going to announce the quiz winners of today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, but before I do that, I would like to go to last week's uh, event and just have a little shout out of all the people who uh, submitted the follow-up actions, which is to name a primate that you've seen near your house. So here we have, um, sorry, back. Oh, okay. So the first one is Nor Liliana. She saw a dusky leaf monkey in Tanjong Tokong. And um, another one is Kirtana Kriya, Kura in Malacca. That's great. And we also have Sivanandan who saw a long tail macaque in Kuala Langat Banting. So keep uh, spotting uh, primates in, in your uh, housing area and keep posting more uh, about where, they, where you've seen them. So now let's go to the uh, today's event and scroll down to the quiz. Today we have 95 participants and 25 quiz submitted. So you have a high chance. So, all right, I'm going to do this drum roll. Oh, oh, the previous one, that's not it. <laughs> Ta-da, all right. So most of you um, are above 70%. And we have, let's see, Pathma Nadan, number one. And Daya Liani, Wuti doesn't count. <laughs> so one, two, three, JT Lu, Chiang Lai Ping, and 100% coming in, Angelo Amarish. Thank you very much for answering the quiz questions and congratulations to our winners. So you can click on this three dash and then find the info button. And here you can scroll down to our contact details where you can send to us your name and your um, house address for us to mail the prizes to you. So thank you very much. And lastly, I hope you can see my screen here. I would like to thank our volunteers uh, and speaker and host and technical support co-host and quiz master of today, um, Professor Sean Lam, myself, uh, Harris, Lanisha, and Zoe Eng. So thank you everyone um, to, uh, for listening today. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we, we can hang around for a couple minutes to chat or um, we can also leave now. So thank you everyone. Thank you once again. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, you Prof. Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Eminem. Thank you yeah, thanks, Thank Uti, and thanks, uh, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Belinda, and uh, Sean's thanks, uh, friend, Professor Yap, too. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> Professor Yap. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why, why I should be thanked, but I, I should thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sean. Professor Yap, we need you to take a membership under MNS NS Malacca branch. Oh, okay. <laughs> totally agree. Yes, I think that's why I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, correct. That's the reason. Here, so yeah. we thank you in advance. <laughs> we assume thank that you're taking up the membership. Now you're wondering why we are thanking you. I, uh, maybe I should give them to my mom. <laughs> yes, can also. No problem. As a gift. Yes.
And also thanks for offering the 100 trees to us, uh, Professor Sean. And <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I can come and see some of them planted. Yes, um, yeah, I think can can we, we, we can arrange when, when we can travel. Not, yeah. not a problem. Great, right? <laughs> because it's an on uh, continuing program, so mm -hmm. it, it, it won't be an issue. Wow. I will, I will help you, Sean. 100 is uh, not a small number. <laughs> maybe I cannot help you as much as before because I have to join the MNS uh, NS and Malacca. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 70 ringgit, don't worry, not 70 dollars. <laughs> it's, it's almost two, two trees, right? <laughs> oh, when you join, it will be under MNS Joho. <laughs> No, 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 no. We've got to oh, get yeah, his address in Negrisum Bilan. Yeah, correct. yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can have two memberships. It's okay. You can put one under yourself and one under your mom. <laughs> yes. Actually, my wife is already a member of MNS Joho. Okay. Actually, yeah. I, you told me I am, <laughs> but, but it's okay. I, I can stay in different places. Yeah. <laughs> But thanks, Sean, very much for showing the maps. It really brings All right, then. Uh, that's a place I used to go as a child. Really? Wow. Uh, Odixon was, uh, was, you know, my family often went to play there. Oh, my. We passed by Lukut. You should have jumped in and shared something. But you know, the road doesn't really reveal the mangrove so much because it oh, passes the, the, the brackish area. A nice, interesting part. Yeah. I mean, it's it's quite remarkable. Just next to Port Dixon is a really big and very beautiful. It, it, what looks like a healthy mangrove. Yeah. Uh, yeah Actually, I think it's now fantastic. that I, I say it, I I remember now there were, there were some I think mangrove along even along the the beach. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, Yin Yi and Lanisha, have you ever gone kayaking through a mangrove? No, I haven't. It, it's a, it's an incredible experience. Yeah, actually, um, I've actually sw swam in a mangrove before. So in one of the field trips that I had during my uh, undergrad degree, uh, one of the field course was um, to go to a mangrove place. Oh, now I forgot what is the name of the place. Probably near Kuala Selangor. And we, we took a, a little, like a little, like wading. <laughs> In, in the water with snorkels and everything and we were looking we had to go really slowly because the mm. water is really like easily disturbed yeah, so we're trying yeah, to look yeah. for like fishes and some birds and stuff um, it was a very memorable experience <laughs> we cannot do that in uh, Sungai Lingi yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah crocodile 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 food <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well Crocodile hasn't eaten me yet, so <laughs> but I have eaten I haven't tried crocodile meat. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I tried it in um in Australia actually when I when I went there for a conference and had crocodile <laughs> meat. <laughs> yeah, Sean, so sorry. Just now I think um there was no time to address my question. Actually, my question is uh what did I say? To, when we want to restore um, uh, mangroves, yeah. uh, do we need to take into consideration the future sea level? You know, taking you know 